kalat na pulong, magiging muong na buong. Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proletaryo. Yes, Mars. Ako na ako palang. Good afternoon, international comrades, and to our migranteng kababayan. Magandang gabi naman po sa inyo, Jan sa Pilipinas at mapagpalayon pagbati para sa ating lahat. Welcome to the National Democratic Online School, the Philippine Society and Revolution Series with Tito Jo. Of course, ongoing pa rin ang ating series till the next next many weeks. So make sure to note this on your calendars and catch updates on our Facebook group and the line online. And patuloy po tayo magimbita ng ating mga kaibigan, kapamilya para makisali at makialam sa ating mga discussion. If you have questions to Tito Jo, later on, just drop it on the chat box and or the comment box. And later, after the discussion, we will be having a question and answer portion, which Tito Jo can answer that. So this series will be a really special one as this tackles our very own Philippine society and our very own Philippine revolutions. So to further give us a background on the topic, let us welcome si Tita Julie Delima. Hi, Tita. Kamusta po kayo? Mute. Maalam na pagbati sa inyo lahat at sa lahat ng nakikinig. Alright, Tita. Tita, to start, um, for, um, my question for you would be, what was the political and economic situation during the time that called for the writing of the P Philippine Society and Revolution? How does this book continue to challenge the current governing system in the Philippines and what role does it have in producing a wide range of activists and revolutionaries? Ah, well, uh, with regard to the socio-economic, political, and cultural situation that necessitated uh, the writing of Philippine society and revolution, and not only that, the waging of the revolution itself, <laughs> uh, the current national democratic movement in the Philippines developed during the height of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, which started in 1947 with the United States adopting con the containment policy articulated in the famous long telegram of the diplomat George Kennan. Na in, uh, he was born 1904 and died 2005, which explained the policy in the following terms. The Soviet Union is a political force committed fanatically to the belief that the United States that with the United States, there can be no permanent modus vivendi, an agreement between parties that disagree. As a result, America only, America's only choice 
was the long-term patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. It must be the policy of the United States, he declared before Congress in 1947, to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by outside pressures. He should have known that it included them. <laughs> the containment policy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union was adopted even as the Soviet Union and the U.S. belatedly were part of the alliance against the Axis powers, uh, Nazi Germany, Mussolini Italy, and Japan, with its greater co-prosperity sphere uh, for Asia too. During World War II, where the Soviet Union played the key role in the defeat of Hitlerite Germany at the cost of over 40 million lives of its people, both military, 14 million dead and missing, and civilian, 26 million out of a population of some 167 million. I uh, pasted a graph here uh, just to let you know that all countries <laughs> suffered uh, heavily from the war and the Philippines uh, among them. Uh, you can go to the third page and you will see that with a population of 16 million at that time, uh, well, the casualty was rather high. This way of thinking would shape American foreign policy for the next four decades until the time of Khrushchev when a policy of the town started uh, that ended the collapse uh, that ended in the collapse and disintegration of the Soviet Union and the emergence of the United States as sole superpower for a while. Among the ramifications of this policy would be the U.S. lead and initiative in the formulation in the formation of the NATO in April 4, 1949 originally 12 member states consisting of Belgium, uh, Canada, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and the UK, and of course, the US. United States. NATO has expanded to 30 member countries now, including former members of the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union. Its current role is to support and to participate in all U.S. wars of aggression from Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan to Iraq, Iran, Syria, and the so-called war against terrorism as a protagonist formation led by the number one real terrorist in its real war of terrorism ranged against peoples of the world. Among the U.S. Cold War achievements are the arms race starting 1949, the production and stockpiling of ever more powerful nuclear weapons and delivery systems, and the limited wars such as Korea that ended in a stalemate resulting in an armistice that keeps the two Koreas, North and South, divided until today, the Vietnam War that ended in U.S. defeat, the U.S. subversion and intervention in Indonesia against Socarno, and the 1965 massacre of millions of Communist Party of Indonesia members, the Afghan war that, that, uh, that continues to this day, the war against Iraq, the toppling of Saddam Hussein in the name of democracy which has left Iraq divided and destabilized, the toppling of Muammar Gaddafi, which like Iraq is now divided and destabilized, Syria, whose fate is uncertain with the U.S. failure of a regime change, the removal of Bashar al-Assad, etc. In the meantime, the space race is heating up and the weapons race is reviving with one more aspiring superpower, China, coming in and the U.S. sinking ever deeper into a death quagmire of its own making mainly from its military expenditures in its wars of aggression, intervention, and military buildup. The project for the new American century, a letterhead group uh, closely associated with the American Enterprise Institute, served as the cornerstone of a neoconservative-led campaign to promote the 2003 invasion of Iraq, 
helping unite key figures from various ideological factions behind the cause. Although this has ended in 2006, its ideology of world conquest is alive and well. Pull up the web page of signatories to the Project for a New American Century, and you will see many familiar names, including Cheney, Rumsfeld, Scooter Libby, Elliot Abrams, etc. Yeah, of course, Jeb Bush, the brother of uh, the former president, Steve Forbes, William Crystal, Dan Quayle, and Paul Wolfowitz for some. PNAC was an extension of the Cold War and continues to motor U.S. foreign policy today under Trump. Uh, Counterinsurgency is defined by the United States Department of State as a comprehensive civilian and military effort taken to simultaneously defeat and contain insurgency and address its root causes. COIN is, in fact, the U.S. war against peoples, revolutions, and liberation movements. The U.S. instigates its use by all regimes facing revolutionary and liberation movements, such as those in countries like the Philippines, India, Colombia, etc. In 1947, the Cold War policy was mirrored in the U.S. itself with the emergence of the McCarthyite witch hunts and the formation of the House and American Activities, or the HUAC, and further on to its colonies and semi-colonies like the Philippines, which in turn created its own anti-subversion law and its own House Committees on Anti-Filipino Activities. Uh, this actually marks the beginning of uh, the re renewed revolutionary movement in the Philippines. Uh, the SCAO was uh, organized and became known due to its, uh, um, what you, uh, to its opposition and demonstrations against the House Committee on Un on Unfilipino Activities. So did in 1960, the Filipino progressive academics, writers, and other intellectuals and students, mostly in the University of the Philippines, uh, also um, hunted as they were in the United States, as those in the intellectuals were in the United States, progressive intellectuals, I mean. In fact, the first significant mass protest action led by the Student Cultural Association of the University of the Philippines was directed against the Anti-Subversion Act when some 5,000 students swarmed into the halls of Congress and scuttled the hearing on it and on suspected subversives and their activities. Being a U.S. semi-colony, the Philippines would be subject to the full effect of the Cold War resulting from the U.S. containment policy against the Soviet Union. These were the circumstances that shaped the intellectual awakening of the young activists. Scout activities included teach-ins, forums, study sessions on Philippine history and society, using the works of progressive authors like Agoncillo, Mahul, etc., inviting guests with progressive ideas to speak on various subjects covering Philippine history and society, as well as current world events and issues. Scout members themselves wrote and published articles and manifestos to raise the people's consciousness and awareness of issues worldwide, such as the protests against the U.S. war of aggression in Vietnam, the mass protests in solidarity and support for the Vietnamese, Cuban, and other peoples under colonial rule, racism, and U.S. imperialism, and in building solidarity links among people's organizations worldwide. These activities and writings guided the mass activists ideologically, politically, and organizationally, and caused the nation, the national democratic movement to grow. SCAOP became a base for further organizing, leading to the founding of Kabataang Makabayan. Kabataang Makabayan promoted mass work, including cultural work among the masses in both urban and rural communities. While at the same time, conducted social investigation there. It linked with the remnant organizations of the old merger party, especially the peasants and the youth. On this basis, it attempted to build the United Front by organizing the movement for the advancement of nationalism, 
or man, but this was later usurped by the Labites revisionists in 1969. <clears throat> With the growth of Kabataang Makabayan and the mass movement nationwide, the proletarian revolutionaries who developed from, from the 1960s onward prepared for the reestablishment of the party and on, on the basis of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism in 1968. They studied and went over the draft rectification document, Rectify Errors and Rebuild the Party, and revised it to include the repudiation of the Labites and their errors, in addition to the criticism and rectification of the er errors of the old party. Recti served to arm the party ideologically. It was the first major theoretical work of the re-established party, in addition to the Marxist, Leninist, Maoist classics, which in the first place guided the drafting of Recti. It built and strengthen the party ideologically and politically by combating right and left opportunist errors. It guided the party leadership and membership to combat and repudiate the domestic, domestic revisionism of the Labites as well as of the Soviet revisionists internationally. Uh, the PSR, as you have noted, is a continuing challenge to the ruling system having produced a broad range of the subjective forces of the Philippine Revolution. PSR is preceded by struggle for national democracy and the rectification documents. As the struggle for national democracy guided the growth and strengthening of the national democratic mass movement prior to the reestablishment of the party, so did the PSR guide the development and advance of the party and the entire revolutionary movement that it leads. It systematic, dialectical, and historical materialist viewpoint, standpoint, and method guide the P leadership and the entire membership in rectifying and strengthening the party and advancing the people's war, despite the series of counter-insurgency campaigns constantly conducted by all the reactionary regimes since the party reestablishment from Marcos down currently to Duterte. PSR will continue to guide the party and the entire revolutionary movement in the current struggle as the party, NPA, and the United Front conduct the People's War and will continue to play this vital role until the victory of the National Democratic Movement and until the revolution advances to the stage of socialism, at which stage the working class party shall draw up and pursue the strategy and tactics for building socialism stage by stage until the stage of communism and the dissolution of the party itself and the state it leads upon the total collapse of imperialism and the reactionaries worldwide. All right. Thank you so much, Tita Julie. Uh, that is a very informative and very sharp background of the Philippine society and revolution. So um, I think we will now proceed to the uh, main discussion. Um, so um, let's now welcome uh, Filipino writer, activist, internationalist, and NDFB consultant, um, Tito Joma Season. Great. All right. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. As we wait for Tito, um, let us watch first the um, aerial video of the protest that has been done. Um, last Friday uh, uh, against the anti-terrorism bill. <laughs> Go, 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 go
Ang seryosohin siya. Hindi ko nga makita eh. Sina! 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 Ang terorista!
Hoy. Low battery warning. Ready, ready. All right. Um, makasama yan po na saksiyan po natin yung protest that happened uh, on the June 4 against an indignation against the anti-terror bill. So to further start our discussion, let's continue now to our discussion. Please welcome um, Filipino writer, activist, internationalist, and, and the NDFP consultant, uh, Professor Joma Sison. Hi, Tito Jo. Kampo lang pagbati po sa inyo. Uh, magandang hapon din. Uh, sa iyo at sa lahat natin tagapukinig. Alright, Tito. So, um, to start our discussion, Tito, can you explain the meaning of mayaman ang Pilipinas pero naghihirap ang sambayan ng Pilipino? How is the Philippines is a rich country? Well, the Philippines has rich natural resources. It has a tropical climate with mountains of volcanic origin, forest, uh, despite heavy uh, deforestation in the last 30 years, and fertile soil, rivers and seas that can assure the people of more than sufficient food and raw materials for manufacturing. It is all the major mineral ores for industrializing the Philippines. Uh, it has iron, gold, copper, nickel, oil, manganese, chrome, zinc, bauxite, and many others. It has huge oil and gas resources in the West Philippine Sea and vast methane gas hydrate deposits in the Benham Rice in North Luzon. We have, uh, aside from having um, uh, rich natural resources, of course, we have uh, a large population. We are uh, 12 uh, in the number. We are number 12 in the list of countries uh, with regard to population. Anyway, uh, the colonial powers and then the imperialist powers uh, uh, got ahead of the Filipinos uh, in um, 
dominating the country and taking advantage of the rich natural resources. And they constantly bribe the reactionary politicians to gain access uh, to and control over these rich resources. We have the human resources, 109 million people um, to, to as productive force to develop uh, these rich resources for our own benefit. Uh, we have a, we are a nation uh, with a high literacy level, skilled workers and peasants, and a large core of uh, professionals in various fields. But unfortunately, those who rule the country act in the interest of the foreign corporations, the big compradors and landlords. We can I'm sorry, Tito. The... Oh, yeah, Tito. Um, sorry, what is the basis of the class division in the Philippines? And does this still apply and relevant now? There are four continuing criteria by which social classes are defined in the Philippines. Ownership of the means of production, role in the organization of production, share in the distribution of the product, and the mode of thinking. Uh, ownership of the means of production is the main determinant of the main exploiting classes. The big compradors own the banks and main trading facilities and import dependent manufacturing. The landlords own large tracts of land. The middle bourgeois own medium type enterprises and the petty bourgeoisie own the small enterprises or small tracts of land that they themselves cultivate. Those who do not own any means of production have to work for those who own them. The workers sell their labor power to the capitalists and to earn their wages or means of subsistence. And most of the peasants steal the land and pay rent to the landlords. The various strata of the bourgeoisie either own, either own enterprises or receive relatively high compensation for their professional or technical services in the bureaucracy or in business companies. Ownership or non-ownership of the means of production also determines one share in the distribution of the social product. The magnitude of one's income or share can be large enough for a highly skilled worker to rank himself and live like the middle class. But more than 95% of the workers get wages for bare subsistence. It is possible for the urban petty bourgeois to shift his class position to that of the capitalist or landlord or to that of the workers on the basis of the mode of thinking. So can a worker abandon his class by becoming a scab of the capitalist during strikes? Likewise, can a peasant abandon his class by becoming an overseer of the landlords? All right, Peter. It is said that even in the pre-colonial period of the Philippines, that slavery and feudal systems were already existing in their society. So what is the difference between the pre-colonial and colonial feudal exploitation? Would it be better if we have not been colonized by the Spanish Empire? The small-scale patriarchal type of slave system existed in the pre-colonial times. There were the Aliping Namamahay, or the house slaves and aliping sagigilid, field slaves, for the land-owning ruling families headed by the datus and rajas. They inherited their slave status or lost their free status because of failure to pay debts, the commission of a crime, or capture in intertribal wars. The feudal system was first established under the Islamic Sultanates in Mindanao, ahead of the coming of of Spanish colonialism. The peasants paid rent to the landlords as well as tribute to religious leaders. In pre-colonial Philippines, there were, small, there were mostly small autonomous communities around bigger communities where the ruling families owned land and slaves. The wealthiest owned the huangas, which were trading boats that could carry as many as 300 passengers. The less wealthy, uh, would own the Karakowas that could carry 50 to 100 people. And the most commonplace boats were the barangays that could carry 30 persons 
and the small boats for local fishing. Uh, you see, um, the uh, ruling class did not have much uh, megalithic or uh, stone structures as uh, in Cambodia or Indonesia, where you have the Angkor Wat and, uh, you know, the Bali uh, structures. Uh, but uh, the wealth was best, was most demonstrated in the form of the boats, in the form of the huangas. Uh, so the, the wealthiest uh, ruling families owned the huangas, and the lesser ones uh, uh, owned the Karakoas. The Islamic Sultanates were the highest social formation before the coming of the Spaniards. With, uh, they had wider agricultural fields and with bigger trading boats of the Huanga and Caracoa type. Uh, Spain was a colonial power um, that was able to place the Philippines, the Philippine archipelago, under a centralized system of administration, develop feudalism on a wide scale, spread Christianity, and cultivated a few Spanish-speaking landlords in more than three centuries. By the law of contradiction, the centralized system of oppression and exploitation over most of the archipelago ultimately resulted in the unity of the people to struggle for national liberation and democracy against colonialism and feudalism. If the Spanish colonialism did not come, most likely the Islamic feudal social system and religious faith would have prevailed in the Philippines, just like in our neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. As historical materialists, we study and analyze uh, uh, the historical facts, and we consider it idle to imagine at length how the Philippines would have become if uh, Spanish colonialism had not come. We have to trace how Spanish colonial, colonial domination ultimately led to the Philippine Revolution of 1896. All right. Tito, can you please discuss the motives of Spain in colonizing the Philippines? Mercantile capitalism was the overriding economic motive of Spain in colonizing the Philippines. Merchants capitalized the colonial expeditions for the purpose of making profits. They were interested in gold and spices from the Philippines. And eventually, the Manila-Acapulco trade developed, and thereafter, the export of commercial crops from the friar states. Colonialism was a major method for primitive accumulation of capital in the history of capitalism. But, of course, there were other motives cited to ennoble and glorify colonialism, like the desire of the Spanish monarchy and the Catholic Church to civilize supposedly civilize and Christianize the barbarians and pagans. Thus, the motives of Spanish uh, colonialism have been described as God, gold, and glory. Up to now, the modern imperialist powers embellish their capitalist operations and wars of aggression with claims to bringing enlightenment, freedom, and progress to the peoples that they oppress and exploit. Dito, what were the economic and political system that the Spanish colonialists imposed, and how did it become effective in colonizing the country further? The Spanish colonialists uh, developed in the main the feudal system through the encomienda system of land grants to the Spanish colonial bureaucrats and military officers through the accumulation of land by religious orders and through letting the native landlords and merchant usurers expand their own land holdings and displace the communal form of agriculture. The Spanish colonialists uh, developed their political system by having a centralized system of administration based in Intramuros, Manila, with Spanish citizens being appointed the governor general and the alcalde mayor as the provincial administrator and an army of uh, Spanish officers and native cons conscripts being deployed at key points in the archipelago. At the municipal level, there was the triumvirate of the Spanish curate, the Spanish uh, parish priest, you know, the Spanish alperes, who was chief of the local civil guards, 
and the native or mestizo Gobernador Silio from the landlord class. All right. Tito, how is it possible that Filipinos accepted the Christianity as the religion and what is the effect of this? Beside religion, what kind of culture did the Spanish colonialists impose and how? The Spanish priests were chaplains of the Spanish conquistador army. When the native population resisted the conquest, the Spanish soldiers delivered a crushing blow to the resisting community with cannons and sword. Then the Spanish priests would go forward to entice the natives to come out of their hiding places by assuring them of peace and safety. But there were also many cases of gun resistance because the Spanish conquistadors with, uh, came with beads and other token gifts for the ruling family in the community. And the Spanish priest offered to give catechetical education to everyone, everyone, ever especially the mothers and children. The children of the landed families were educated in the Spanish language and religion and schools run by the friars. Up to the middle of the 19th century, the highest profession a native could aspire for was the priesthood. Thereafter, natives were admitted to the University of Santo Tomas and other tertiary schools to take up courses in law, medicine, engineering, and other high professions. Some children of well-to-do landed and merchant families went to Spain to study in the last two decades of the Spanish colonial rule. They included Jose Rizal, Marcelo H. del Pilar, Graciano Lopez Jaina, and others who imbibed liberal democratic ideas and formed the propaganda movement uh, with La Solidaridad as their main publication. All right. Tito, did the Filipinos resist on the early colonial period? Of course, most communities resisted the arrival of the Spanish colonialists. They came from afar, from the opposite side of the vast uh, Pacific Ocean, that means to say from Latin America. They usually ran out of supplies and had to requisition for the natives. They could not have been so attractive and so welcome to the natives. They were prone to take things away without paying. Lapu-Lapu made short shrift of Magellan and the shallow waters of Mactan Island. Some decades later, in the 16th century, Legaspi came and was also resisted, but he was able to use the tactics of divide and rule more successfully than Magellan. He befriended certain Visayan communities and then rec recruited them um, as soldiers, for, uh, recruited from them soldiers for further expeditions and conquest under Spanish officers in other parts of the archipelago. <clears throat> Before a certain province could be created, under an alcalde mayor, the area was considered a corregimiento, a war zone, subject to pacification by the Spanish, uh, and uh, was placed under the rule of the corregidor, the conqueror, huh? or uh, a warrior uh, chief. People in the lowlands um, uh, along the sea and major rivers were relatively easier to conquer than the tribal communities on high ground, like the Igorots, Mangyans, and Lumad. Uh, thus, these upland tribal communities would resist Spanish colonialism and retain the indigenous culture. They have been estimated at 18% of the Philippine population. The Moro and the Igorot tribes were the most uh, um, <coughs> outstanding and resisting Spanish colonialism up to its end and in launching counter-offensives. The Moros did not only defend themselves on Spanish offensives, but also sailed out to do counter-offensives against colonial outposts as far as the sea coast of northwestern Philippines. The Igorots were successful at warding off attempts of the Spanish colonialists to access and opened the gold mines, launched counterattacks, cooperated with Ilocanos, who revolted against Spain and joined the Philippine Revolutionary Movement against Spain and then against U.S. imperialism. 
Tito, what was the goal of the 1896 revolution? Do they already have a concrete ideology or theories during that time? What do you think their mistakes um, so that we can prevent them from happening in waging, in waging, in, in the waging armed revolution today? The goal of the 1896 uh, revolution was to secure national independence and democracy by force of arms. The leaders of the Katipunan, like Bonifacio, studied the French Revolution and received study materials from those in the propaganda movement in Spain. Their ideology was liberal democratic. Even if Bonifacio was a worker, he shared this, this ideology with the anti-colonial illustrados, plebeians, and peasants. The Philippine Revolution of 1896 was successful in defeating Spanish colonialism in 1898, despite the criminal acts of Aguinaldo in uh, eliminating Bonifacio and then Antonio Luna. The fatal weaknesses of the Aguinaldo government uh, would come out in the capitulation to Spain in the Pact of Piac de Bato, and uh, then under the pressure of the two-handed policy of U.S. imperialism, one hand offering benevolent assimilation, which sugar-coated Uh, which was sugar-coated with Jeffersonian expressions, and the other a ruthless mail fist for destroying the revolutionary movement with a machine gun and water cure torture. The bourgeois liberal revolutionaries were not yet equipped with Marxism-Leninism to comprehend the nature and capabilities of modern imperialism. The current revolutionary movement has learned lessons not only from the old democratic revolution, but also uh, from the earlier attempt of the old Communist Party to lead the struggle for national and social liberation from imperialism and feudalism from 1930 to the early 1950s. As an individual, Aguinaldo had a weak subjectivist character. Soon after his capture by the U.S. Army, he issued a call for the surrender of the people. In contrast, the sublime paralytic Apollinario Mabini had a stronger patriotic character and will. Even in captivity, he prevailed over all pressures on him to bow to U.S. imperialism. Learning a lesson from the capitulationist character of Aguinaldo, the current revolutionary movement is ever ready to reject the counter-revolutionary call of any leader in prison. Is it true that Americans helped us win our revolution? If not, then what is their intention intervening in the Filipino struggle for independence from Spain? The U.S. pretended to offer help to the Aguinaldo government in exile in Hong Kong. It received money for three shipments uh, of arms, but delivered only one shipment. It brought back Aguinaldo and other leaders to Cavite on an American cutter or an American boat, and he would be able to proclaim Philippine independence on June 12, 1898, uh, under the protection of the noble and mighty America. And that's, uh, uh, that uh, qualification practically uh, uh, indicated that he was willing uh, to turn the Philippines to a protectorate of the U.S. The Filipino revolutionary forces were able to rapidly strengthened themselves because of victories and battles and the transfer of Filipino colonial conscripts from the local civil guards and Spanish colonial army to the revolutionary side. Thus, they were able to defeat Spanish colonialism on a nationwide scale and occupy all strategic points to encircle Intramuros. But uh, as U.S. reinforcements came from outside the Philippines, arrived, uh, the U.S. Army pushed out the Filipino revolutionary forces from their advantageous positions in um, uh, Manila and suburbs. Uh, the U.S. Um, finally, the U.S. and Spain secretly agreed that the latter surrender Manila to the former in order to preempt the Filipino revolutionaries from seizing Intramuros. The agreement was in line with the peace negotiations in Paris for Spain to sell the Philippines to the U.S. for the amount of $20 million dollars, U.S. dollars. Thus, the ground was laid for U.S. imperialism to claim victory over Spain and assert power over the Philippines. It led to the outbreak of the Filipino-American War 
on February 4, 1899, when the U.S. began to attack the Filipino forces. The U.S. had constantly the intention and plan to grab the Philippines for itself as a base for expanding economic territory in Asia, turning the Pacific Ocean into a uh, uh, so-called American lake and getting a share of the big Chinese melon, which was uh, then being divided among the imperialist powers. The U.S. was a modern imperialist power engaged in the struggle for a redivision of the world in order to obtain colonies as uh, sources of cheap raw materials, markets, field of investments, and spheres of influence. That, that's why it declared war on Spain, a decrepit colonial power to grab Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines. Thank you, Tito. Um, I think um, we we still have further more questions, but I think um, we should proceed more for a short break. Um, uh, so um, please watch this. Um, this uh, we will continue this discussion after a short break. Oh, 
That was taken last June 12, um, the Grand Mañanita Day in the University of the Philippines. That was Aling Marie speaking, um, leading the protest. Um, she's the viral lady um, who is um, um, stating her dissent against uh, government and whoever patronizes it. 
So now, um, current, uh, we are zooming to our discussion. So we are now currently on the U.S. intervening in the Philippine uh, 1986 rev- 1989 revolution. So, Tito, as a question to continue, why and how did the American imperialists retain feudalism in the Philippines? Did they introduce a new political and economical system? Or how was it able to retain its colonial rule over the Philippines? Oh, well, U.S. imperialism retained feudalism in the Philippines as the base for imposing monopoly capitalism on the entire economy and for acquiring a nationwide network of political puppets from the landlord class. From the symbiosis of feudalism and monopoly capitalism emerged the semi-feudal economy and the comprador big bourgeoisie as the cheap native ruling class arising from the landlord class. To make the economy semi-feudal, the U.S. colonial regime allowed the free movement of peasants from one area to another beyond the old feudal controls, expanded the plantations for export, opened the mines, improved the infrastructure for domestic and foreign trade, and promoted the public school system, but also the private schools run by religious orders to increase the number of professionals and clerks to serve the expanding businesses and bureaucracy. The U.S. was able to appease the local exploiting classes and retain its colonial role by promising to grant independence after educating and training the Filipinos for self-rule. But in the meantime, it engaged in brainwashing the Filipinos to become brown Americans, further entrenching U.S. economic interests, training politicians as agents of both U.S. imperialism and the local exploiting classes, and making them pass through stages of subordination to the U.S. But eventually, U.S. colonial rule in the Philippines would be shaken by the inter-imperialist war, uh, World War II, that led to Japan occupying the Philippines, and by the growth of the revolutionary movement. Tito, uh, what was the Philippines' involvement in the Second World War? And how was the U.S. imperialism able to come back to rule over the Philippines after the war? The Commonwealth government was still a creature and puppet of U.S. imperialism, although the U.S. conceded that it was a government in transition to the grant of independence in 1946. Thus, in facing up to the Japanese invasion and occupation of the Philippines, The U.S. and Commonwealth government of Quezon agreed to integrate uh, Filipino troops and eventually pro-U.S. Filipino guerrilla forces um, into the uh, U.S. armed forces in the Far East, or the USAFE. The old Communist Party was able to build a strong armed revolutionary army, mainly in central Luzon and partly in the southern Tagalog region during World War II and thereafter, but failed to seed the whole country with revolutionary cadres. Uh, due to the anti-fascist United Front since 1936, the old CPP and Hukbalahap could have alliance with some USAFE guerrilla units, but maintain their independence and initiative. The two anti-Japan guerrilla forces avoided collision when they could not cooperate at any rate, the U.S. was able to come back to rule the Philippines towards the end of World War II, uh, that was in 1944 and 1945, by reconquering the Philippines uh, from the Japanese Imperial Army through successful naval, air, and ground operations, and then granting nominal independence to the Philippines on July 4, 1946, after making sure that the Philippines would remain a semi-colony by retaining its military bases and the property rights of U.S. corporations and citizens. Thus, the U.S. was able to ship the Philippines from the colonial and the semi-feudal system before World War II to the semi-colonial and semi-feudal system after the war. 
The resistance of Communist Party was first seen against the Japanese occupation in the Philippines in 1942. However, many historians dismisses the involvement of the Hukbalahap with PKP. Why do you think so? The old Communist Party, to be more precise, the old merger party of the Communist and Socialist parties established and led the Hukbo ng Bayan Laban sa Apon or Hukbalahap. This is an undeniable historical fact. All serious historians acknowledge this fact. But of course, the leadership of the old Communist Party under Vicente Lava as General Secretary made the right opportunist error called Retreat for Defense, which stunted the growth of the People's, Part, People's Army with the fragmentation of the companies to small teams of three to five fighters. But the majority of cadres and members of the old CPP and red commanders and fighters of the Hukbalap objected to the right opportunist line and proceeded to fight with platoon size and even company size uh, operations against the Japanese army in eastern and uh, in the eastern and western provinces of central Luzon. When the retreat for defense policy line was rejected at the Bagumbali conference, In September 1943, Vicente Lava pushed one more wrong line to welcome the return of the Commonwealth government, convert the People's Army into a legal veterans organization, and end the revolutionary armed struggle. By then, the U.S. military forces were already, already unleashing air and naval offensives in the Pacific and uh, preparing for the landing of U.S. troops in the Philippines in the following year of uh, 1944. All right. Tito, can the presence of Hukbalahap be expounded in regards of defending the Philippines against Japanese occupation? And what can the present revolutionaries learn from them? Uh, despite the right opportunist errors of the Vicente Lava leadership in the fight against the Japanese occupation, The leaders and members of the old CPP, the Red Commanders and Fighters of the Hukbalahap, and the revolutionary masses were able to grow in strength and liberated the central Luzon from the Japanese fascists, following the examples of the Huk squadrons in the mountainous areas of Nueva Ezea and Bataan. The Huk squadrons reemerged in the plains of central Luzon on time for the offensive against the Japanese fascists. The lessons to learn from the positive and negative experience of the old CPP and the Hukmalahap in fighting the Japanese occupation can be read and studied in the rectification document, rectify errors and rebuild the party. The teachings of Mao Zedong on people's war helped a lot in the analysis of the experience of the CPP and the Hukmalahap. Why did the U.S. imperialists give the Philippines independence? Independence. How did they make sure they still have colonial control over the country even they are no longer directly in power? Some high U.S. officials at first expressed reluctance to fulfill the U.S. promise of independence. But there was the strong demand for national independence for the entire Filipino people. And there was the challenge posed by the armed revolutionary movement despite the right opportunist tendency of the leadership of the old CPP. Although Manuel Rojas was made president by the U.S. from being a recent pro-Japanese puppet, there was the Democratic Alliance and the Nationalist Party demanding national independence. The U.S. made sure that they would continue to control the Philippines as a semi-colony under the Treaty of General Relations, which guaranteed the continuance of the property rights of uh, U.S. corporations and citizens and U.S. military bases. The U.S. felt confident about yielding national administration to the political representatives of uh, the local oligarchy, the Comprador Big Bourgeoisie and the landlord class. In fact, they nullified the election of the six elected congressmen of the Democratic Alliance in 1946 uh, in order to obtain the votes for making the parity amendment in the Constitution, which allowed U.S. corporations and citizens to have rights equal to those of the Filipinos in exploiting natural resources 
and operating public utilities. How did the Filipino people continue their resistance after the Philippines' so-called independence? As a result of the defeat of the Japanese occupation, the old CPP, the Democratic Alliance, the Congress of Labor Organizations, the Civil Liberties Union, and other patriotic and progressive organizations became strong in the Manila Rizal region and waged outstanding legal struggles against the persistence of U.S. domination and the reactionary policies of the local exploiting classes of big compradors and landlords. The armed units of the Hukbalahap remained active because the U.S. imperialists and the reactionary puppets created the civilian guards to take back the land from the peasants to the landlords and to kill caterers and members of the old CPP, Hukbalahap, and the Peasant Association. The enemy launched an anti-communist campaign in both cities and the countryside. Thus, the revolutionary forces and masses had to fight back with various forms of struggle. Because of the attacks of the enemy, the old CPP under the Jose Lava leadership decided to wage armed struggle against the puppet regime and renamed the People's Army, Hukbong Mapagpalaya ng Bayan, or People's Liberation Army, in 1948. But the Jose Lava leadership adopted the left opportunist or adventurous line to win victory within two years by banking on the outrage of the Filipino people over the corruption of the Quirino regime and on an unreliable alliance with the Laurel-led opposition and without paying attention to the needs of painstaking mass work, land reform, accumulation of armed strength, and nationwide expansion of the revolutionary forces. The forces of the HMB of only 2,500 fighters were based mainly in camps on the Sierra Madre mountain range and secondarily in the western mountains of central Luzon. They were able to make dramatic attacks and seizures of major military camps in central Luzon in 1949. But in a few months thereafter, the urban-based Politburo Inn of the Jose Lava leadership was rounded up in Manila and the crackdown began against the urban-based legal democratic forces. As leader of the rural-based Politburo out, Jesus Lava assumed the overall leadership of the old CPP and the revolutionary movement and declared the continuance of the arms revolution in 1951 but the left opportunist line of Jose Lava was never criticized and rectified. The old CPP was afflicted by contradiction between the Lava faction and the Taruk faction. And the enemy battalions duly trained and armed by the U.S. By, and, and the Cywar campaign launched by the CIA worked effectively against the old CPP and HMV. Eventually, Amidst the weakening of the armed revolution, Jesus Lava took the right opportunist line of calling for the conversion of the HMB into organizational brigades and, in effect, for the liquidation of uh, the People's Army in 1955 and then adopted the single file policy in 1957 that resulted in the liquidation of the branches and other collective units of the CPP. Tito, was Marcos significantly different from the previous president? What pushed him to declare martial law? Marcos was significantly different from the previous presidents because he deliberately generated the conditions for him to impose a fascist dictatorship on the people at a time of relative stability after the backbone of the armed revolutionary movement was broken around 1952. Uh, there was some amount of social unrest emerging from the chronic crisis of the ruling system. But Marcos exaggerated it as social volcano about to erupt, if not preempted by constitutional amendments. The actual purpose of Marcos for amending the constitution was to make provisions that would allow him to stay in power beyond what was then the constitutional limit of two four-year terms and grab absolute power as fascist dictator in order to achieve absolute corruption. Marcos came from the rural bourgeoisie, born of a father from a rich 
peasant family and a mother from a small landlord family. He was envious of the wealth of the big company of the landlords and wanted to join them and even surpass them through the exercise of political power and bureaucratic corruption. His uh, formula for rising to absolute power was to hire former left-wing writers to ghostwrite nationalist speeches for him, ingratiate himself with the Lopez family to gain media support, take money from the big companies and landlords, steal huge amounts of public money by taking large foreign loans for infrastructure projects, and then overpricing them, and then scapegoating the newly re-established revolutionary forces in the late 1960s in order to call for charter chains and for the use of the commander-in-chief provision and martial law provision of what was uh, the existing constitution. Tito, was there any president that served the interest of the, pe- of the Filipino people or would that be possible? All presidents of the Commonwealth and the Puppet Republic um, have been demagogues. They posture as patriots and nationalists and as Democrats and advocates of social justice. But if you take a hard look at them, you can see that they are puppets of U.S. imperialism and take their electoral campaign funds from foreign intelligence agencies and uh, uh, the big compradors and landlords. When uh, they are in power, they enrich themselves in collaboration with their business cronies as their bagmen. They um, <clears throat> and uh, they proceed to suppress the people uh, in order to have uh, the way uh, entrench themselves in power. Uh, that's the case. Uh, that has been the case for all presidents. Uh, since uh, uh, the Commonwealth government and the founding of the so-called Third Republic. All right. All right, Tito. Uh, Thank you so much, Tito, for um, the discussion. So I will be having a small break um, now, and then we will now... All right. And um, we will now proceed to, um, we will proceed next to the question and answer portion. So if you have questions in mind um, along the discussions that have been discussed, you could drop it down at the comment box and uh, we will um, take note of it and um, ask Tito Jo about it and um, he will answer it after the break. So um, so now uh, could we, uh, we, we, we can watch um, the, Grand Manianita, the Grand Manianita protest that happened last June 12th. Um, so, um, and uh, we can watch it right now. Right. So, um, um, as uh, our tech crew is, uh, as the tech crew is still preparing the um, the video for our break, um, don't forget to um, that we this that this series will continue up until the next two weeks. Um, this uh, Philippine society and revolution. So please watch, uh, please take note of this. Uh, this is on every Sunday, 2 p.m. United Kingdom time and 3 p.m. Central Europe time. This will be happening. The next one would be on the June 21st, and um, that is the part three of the Philippine society and revolution, the three fundamental problems of the Philippines, and the next one is the 28th. Uh, on the 28th of June, the part 4 of the Philippine Society and Revolution that we will be discussing. This is um, a very uh, important discussion for all of us as this tackles our very own history as the, Philipp- uh, as the history of the revolution that happened in the Philippines and how the society works even uh, in the time of, uh, of the previous administration as you can do. Uh, Alright, so um, uh, can you can on our uh, You could also like our page so you could have more further updates on, uh, on the details uh, on the events that we are making 
Mm-hmm. And uh, you could also, um, if you are into art, if you are an artist and you're into and you could and you're into art, we um we also have Panday Sining Europa who produces um artworks. And if you are an, an artist and you want to produce one and help us, you could um easily message us. So um we um so you could help us and um and to um to produce more artworks and cultural works as you know and uh we are conducting also um um uh they uh radio shows at rad um at silakbo media you could like their page www.facebook.com slash silakbo media um they are airing every tuesday and friday um 8 p.m central europe time 7 p.m on the um, united kingdom they are tackling uh, current events and they are relaying um, alternative news to um, to to the Filipino people, uh, most especially the one, especially to the migrants here in Europe. So I- All right. Again, um, um, we before we proceed to the break, no, um, just make sure uh, if you have questions in mind that um, that um, have not been tackled or you have been confused off in this discussion or you just have a question in mind, you can drop it in the comment box and uh, we will take note of it. So Tito Tito jo, Tito Joma can answer it after the break. I know. Ayon. So um, so. So um yes so uh, again we are we are conducting this educational discussion for the next following weeks so make sure again to to note this on your calendars and watch updates on our Facebook group next next um on the June 21st we will be tackling um the Philippine Society Re- Revolution Part 2 the three fundamental problems of the Philippine society so on the June 28th we will be discussing the People's Democratic Revolution is the only solution. So why is it the only solution? Catch that on June 28th. And um, next one, of course, this series will continue. The next topic would be on July, on the 5th of July, would be ESCUM or um, Especial na Curso Pang Masa, um, tackling the topic for the Magsasaka. So it will be um, extensive discussion, um, pr- um, more tackling the conditions uh, the social economic conditions of the farmers in the Philippines and why is uh, People's Democratic Revolution relevant to them? So we will now proceed to the break. This is the video of the Grand Manionita protest last June 12, 2020, Independence Day at University of the Dip- Philippines, the demand. So um, after this, we will already be having a question and answer portion. Okay, we, um, this is the Grand Manionita pro- protest. In this now, we can go to ang mga salita ng ating pambansang awit. Samahan niyo sana ako ang nanamnamin ang ibig nitong sabihin. Maligayang araw ng kalayaan sa ating lahat. Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan, Alab ng puso sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, duyan ka ng magiting. Sa manlulupig, di ka pasisiil. Sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong bughaw, May dilag ang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal. Ang kislap ng watawat mo'y tagumpay na nagliningning. Ang bituin at araw niyang kailan pa may di magdidilim. Lupa ng araw ng luwalhati pagsinta. Buhay ay langit sa piling mo. Aming ligaya na pag may mang aapi ang mamatay ng dahil sa iyo. 
Ang tao ang bayan. Ngayon ay lumalaban. Ngayon ay lumalaban. Ang tao ang bayan. Maligayang araw ng kalayaan Pilipinas. Babawiin natin ang sa atin. Sabay-sabay po nating awitin ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan, alam ng puso sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, duyan ka ng magiting, sa manluluti, di ka pa sisiil, sa dagat at bundok, sa simoy at sa langit mong bukaw. May ilalang tula at awit sa paglalang minamahal, ang isap ng wataw at mo'y tabong kay hanap ni Ningning. Ang bituin na araw niya kay nanpang ay di magdidilim. Lupa ng araw ng walhan pagsinta, buhay ay nangit sa piling mo. Aming ligaya ng tagay mga kapi, ang mga Ayan mga kababayan, ipagpatuloy po natin ang ating pagpanawagan ngayong araw. Jump! Jump! Terror Bill! Jump! Jump! Terror Bill! Jump! Jump! Terror Bill! Jump! Jump! Terror Bill! Ang tao, ang bayan, ngayon ay lumalaban! Ngayon ay lumalaban! Ang tao, ang bayan! Pasi! And alalahanin po natin ngayong araw kung bakit tayo mapanahas na hinarap ang banta ng karahasan mula sa polisya, mula sa pasistang gobyerno sa kabila ng anumang pagbabanta nila laban sa kaligtasan natin ay pinili natin na pumilos ngayong araw dahil tinikilala natin ang kahalagahan ng paglaban para sa ating mga karapatan. Ayaw naman po natin na, na ituring nila tayo bilang terorismo kung nandito lang tayo Diba? Wala namang problema para sa mga pulis ni Manyanita, di ba? Dapat, dapat lang. Kasi naman sila din naman gumagawa ng Manyanita eh. Tayo-tayo lang din naman. Ayan, kaya ngayon naman, susunod na nating tatawagan ang magbibigay sa atin ng, pani ng ating opening remarks mula sa UP Diliman Chancellor, si Fidel... Si okay. Mula sa, mula sa bayan, si Granato. Imbes na awitin, gusto kong bigkasin ang mga salita ng ating pambansang awit. Samahan niyo sana ako ang nanamnamin ang ibig nitong sabihin. Maligayang araw ng kalayaan sa ating lahat. Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan, Alab ng puso sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang. Duyan ka ng magiting. Sa manlulupig, di ka pasisiil. And now we are back in our question and on uh, the on our discussion for the Philippine Society and Revolution Part One and Twos. We will now proceed to our question and answer portion. So if you have question in mind, just drop it down sa our comment box, sa our Facebook Live, and uh, we will take note of it so Tito Jo could answer it. So um, we will now proceed to the first question, Tito. 
Um, from this is from the audience. While Filipinos were waging armed resistance during the 60s, is there a massive protest ongoing in every cities or provinces? Well, while the uh, revolutionary uh, movement was strong in the countryside with the um, HMB, or uh, I might say, while it was relatively strong and still fighting up to the 19, uh, uh, up to the early 1950s, uh, there was a strong mass movement in the urban areas. Uh, for instance, the uh, Congress of Labor Organizations was very strong, and uh, there were other mass formations. But then the, <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, intelligence agency, CIA, and the uh, uh, Filipino reactionaries headed by um, uh, Ramon Magsaysay cracked down on the uh, urban mass movement. And uh, while the um, uh, Lava, uh, the wrong Jose Lava leadership was failing, and uh, the, the armed movement was being um, su successfully attacked by the counter-revolutionary forces, the mass movement weakened. So in most of the 1950s, eventually, the mass movement subsided. But then we, uh, the, the, we the revolutionary students, started uh, a study groups in 1959. And by 1961, we had the biggest mass action after a long time. A uh, mass action with an anti-imperialist and um, um, an anti-feudal character, or they took the form of opposing uh, anti-communist witch hunting by the so-called anti-Filipino uh, committee on anti-Filipino anti-Filipino activities in the lower house of Congress. Uh, it is a copycat uh, committee uh, uh, mimicking. Uh, the so-called uh, Committee on Un-American Activities, which uh, spearheaded um, uh, the anti-communist witch hunt in the U.S. Uh, in the early 50s. So we broke, we sort of broke the, uh, the ice. Uh, after uh, quite uh, some time uh, of silence, in the uh, anti-imperialist and anti-feudal front, uh, uh, we had this uh, demonstration of 5,000 students, uh, mainly coming from the University of the Philippines. Then from 1961 to 1964, we had smaller, we had smaller mass actions. But by 1965, after Kabatang was established, we had demonstrations of 25,000 against the Laurel Langley Agreement, uh, the U.S. military bases, and other, uh, and other treaties uh, by which the Philippines was uh, uh, subordinated uh, to the U.S. to U.S. imperialism. Right. So, 1965 was, was a high point with 25,000, and then subsequently, then we would have uh, demonstrations uh, uh, smaller size. But then uh, the intensity and the frequency increased by 1967 to 1969. And that was the period when the Communist Party was being established. Was established in uh, 1968, December 26, 1968. And three months afterwards, the New People's Army was established. So on March uh, 29, 1968, uh, 69. And then, <clears throat> while uh, the armed struggle uh, began in Tarlac province, uh, mass actions kept on developing. So, by 1960, no, by 1970, you had the first quarter storm of 1970, which uh, involved 100 to uh, 150,000 people attending uh, every demonstration. Seven of them uh, during the first quarter of 1970. So I'm now mentioning the high points in the mass movement. Uh, it goes to show that the armed struggle, as well as the uh, the 
legal mass protest were connected to the worsening crisis of uh, the Philippine ruling system. Um, those were signals that um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the semi-colonial and semi-feudal system was all, all exploding. But at the same time, Marcos wanted to take advantage of the conditions and he also used, used the conditions to prepare for his fascist dictatorship uh, uh, by uh, proclaiming martial law in 1972. Right. Tito, next question. Uh, many regard Ramon Magsaysay as a great president of the of the people. Can you explain how he collaborated, how he, Ramon Magsaysay, collaborated with the CIA and was used as a tool for the United States imperialism? You know, in, uh, even after uh, the so-called Declaration of Independence, uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, um, had a lot of control. Uh, within the Philippine government, in the bureaucracy of the Quirino Poster Agreement to control the bureaucracy. And, uh, you know, from then on, uh, you know, American agencies like the AID uh, would be uh, the main instrument for controlling uh, the bureaucracy. Then in the military, you have the CIA um, as uh, the main intelligence agency. Uh, that can manipulate the uh, political events in the Philippines. And uh, also, uh, another intelligence agency of the U.S. is the Defense Intelligence Agency of the Pentagon. Uh, but anyway, uh, the agency that is most active politically in taking initiatives, uh, in supporting a, a, a president or presidential candidate that they like, is the CIA. And it's also the same agency which is the most active in uh, bringing down uh, a president when uh, he turns out to be uh, more of an as more of a liability than an asset to U.S. imperialism. So uh, up to now, the CIA is involved, and you know, in the Philippines, uh, you have a complicated situation. You have a uh, you have a uh, uh, president whose loyalty is only to his. Uh, to himself and to his own pocket, no? So he takes advantage of two imperialist powers now, no? So he he likes to say sometimes that he's building towards China because he likes the money from the drug lords and uh, from the operators of the casinos. You know, that's on the illegal side, the unofficial side. And he likes to make money on contracts with uh, official contracts with uh, Chinese state corporations. So you have that kind of president, no? So long as he benefits, he's for it, no? At the same time, uh, you have on the, he, he's afraid the U.S. is he's, he's surrounded by pro-U.S., by pro-U.S. Uh, officials, uh, especially at the Department of National Defense. Lorenzana is a longtime Washington uh, uh, resident, and um, uh, he's close uh, to the U.S. authorities. So, um, now, um, you know why Duterte, for instance, uh, uh, terminated the peace negotiations in uh, 2017? That was because he was told by uh, Trump, President Trump, when he visited the Philippines, uh, to stop the negotiations uh, and uh, try to, and he told Marcos, uh, I mean Duterte, to wipe out the Communist Party, and if he does so, and, um, and then uh, he enjoys your support. And if, in addition, uh, Duterte would give 100% ownership of uh, Philippine land, natural resources, uh, and all businesses in the Philippines to U.S. corporations, then uh, the better. So, um, and uh, Duterte agreed with Trump. So he tries to maintain loyalty to two imperialist powers. Now, the two imperialist powers since 2018, had been in conflict. Huh? So he might have a problem there. Uh, so, and you know, and you know how the, how the, how, how the uh, interests of two imperialist powers can collide. You know, the U.S., for instance, doesn't like um, uh, 5G of China Telecom to be in the Philippines. But what has Duterte done? Because Dennis Oi gets a lot of money for him. 
uh, for the project. He even puts the uh, uh, the telecom, China Telecom, in the military camps. Eh? Uh, you know, the, the uh, cell towers are being put up in military camps. And that is very much against the uh, U.S. Enhanced, uh, enhanced Development Cooperation Agreement, whereby the U.S. can use, eh? can make its own camps within the, with the Philippine military camps. See, so two, uh, two imperialist powers uh, colliding have, uh, uh, have uh, different facilities inside. Uh, you have the U.S. facilities with its uh, storage of arms uh, uh, for the U.S. Pers rotating personnel. And at the same time, you have the, 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 you have the Chinese-owned telco uh, with its cell towers in the military camps. So uh, Duterte might be finished up by the U.S. Um, he might be dropped like a hot potato, uh, like uh, Marcos was dropped by his good friend Reagan. Huh? You know, Ma Marcos was a good friend of Reagan, but when American national interest was uh, already involved, uh, Re Reagan dropped Marcos. So uh, um, anyway, uh, we were... Uh, 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 this idiot uh, uh, Trump would drop him on that, the so-called deep state. You know, there is a deep state in the in the U.S. Uh, that can decide the fate of any puppet president. So Duterte, as a puppet president, uh, is now in a is now in a uh, what you would call a difficult situation for him in terms of uh, political survival. But he like you know. But he loves to present himself as a strong man to the Filipino people whom he thinks he can kill at will. But the Filipino people are beginning to rise up, no? And um, they can rise up and overthrow a puppet like they did huh? uh, when the time of Marcos came uh, to fall. All right, Tito. Next question, Tito. In terms of the current situation in... Uh, in terms of the current situation as continuation of history, which, um, sorry, um, sorry, this is a previous question. Next question, Dito, would be how did the Washington consensus affect the development of the Philippines? Washington consensus. consensus. Uh, uh, you see, uh, the U.S., uh, you know, the Philippines still bound by uh, a series of military treaties with the U.S., no? Even if the military basis agreement was, uh, or treaty was, uh, you know, knocked out in 1991, there has been a series of agreements uh, which um, keep the, Philipp the U.S. military uh, in force in the Philippines. So the U.S. still continues to dominate the Philippines uh, militarily. Uh, the Philippines remains its favorite base for maintaining U.S. power in East Asia. It is the reliable base to face up to, uh, the, uh, uh, to China or the Asian mainland. So the U.S. Is not give, has not given up the, uh, the Philippines uh, by uh, military treaties arising after uh, uh, 1991, non-extension of the U.S. military bases. I mean, the agreements, uh, like the, uh, they started with, you know, this um, uh, mutual uh, uh, logistical support agreement and then, then the visiting forces agreement uh, was devised and then you have the EDCA, uh, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. So, <clears throat> now, uh, China has been quite aggressive, no? Uh, you know, a uh, big trouble spot is the West Philippine Sea. China has been aggressive, uh, it thinks it owns the entire uh, China Sea, or at least 90 percent, no? And it has been, uh, uh, it has uh, built and militarized uh, uh, islands in the, in the uh, uh, exclusive economic zone of the Philippines in violation of the sovereign rights of the Philippines. And, uh, of course, uh, the U.S. doesn't like this. Also, the European powers and Japan do not like this because, um, well, um, uh, at least they recognize international law and the UN 
Convention on the Law of the Sea, which uh, uh, under which the Philippines clearly owns, uh, I mean, uh, clearly uh, has under its uh, sovereign power uh, and right uh, the West Philippine Sea. And uh, this is a point where, you know, the two imperialist powers are also colliding. And Duterte has been, uh, has proven himself very much of a traitor by allowing China to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, build and militarize uh, seven, seven islands. And at the same time, uh, Scarborough uh, has been placed under US, uh, China control with uh, Duterte's encouragement. So Duterte uh, stands as a traitor to the Filipino people. And at the same time, uh, he offends U.S. imperialism because it is favoring uh, a contrary, a, a rival of uh, U.S. imperialism, which is uh, uh, Chinese imperialism. So there is a complicated situation in the Philippines. And uh, it, is, uh, it has become more complicated because you have the treason of Duterte. All right. Tito, um, thank you. I think that is the last question that have, that was sent by the audience. And um, I think we are now closing the floor for the questions as we are already ending our discussion. Thank you, Tito, uh, so much for our discussion today. It, it, it is very informative and very sharp and um, enlightening as well. So, uh, po nagtatapos ang ating discussion. Another productive day of learning while serving our, of course, quarantine sentences, mga kasama. Apakasayang mag-aral at matbuto. Stand by next week, June 21, 2020. Same time, 2 p.m. UK, 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. Europe time. And for our next discussion, the part two of the Philippine Society and Revolution, the three fundamental problems of the Philippine Society. So make sure to note this on your calendar and catch updates on our Facebook group and the line online and to our Facebook page, um, Anak Bayan Europa, for updates. Um, so please... Um, invite more comrades and your friends to participate in this event dahil mas masaya mag-aral kapag mas marami tayo. Uh, maraming salamat po, maraming maraming salamat po sa nakibahagi sa aming diskusyon, sa mga nanood, nakinig from Europe, New Zealand, Asia, Berlin, um, Australia, and um, Philippines of course. Um, we have live viewers there. At um, ako po ulit, si Kasamang Christ, kasama po si Tito Joma, Tito Joma, may last, uh, may baka po tayong gustong sabihin sa ating audience bago tayo mag-end? Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity for me eh, to say thank you uh, to you, Angelo, and uh, uh, to all our uh, listeners. Um, I wish that they would um, uh, participate uh, uh, in the next uh, session and this series. All right, Tito. Again, thank you po so much for listening and being with us in our discussion. Uh, mapagpalayang gabi po sa ating lahat. Pagkakaisa, pagsulong Narito ako Para sa pagwawasto Magdaluyong Narito ako Para ang galat-galat Na pulo Magiging muong Tabuo
makaisa pagsulong na rito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong na rito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat na pulo, magiging muod na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban, pagumpay sa ating bayan Ay ang bagsada Kalat-kalat na pulong Magiging muong 